Hello everyone, it's Jabari here. Welcome to the next video of a series in which is entirely different from my usual style of video. Usually all of my content is presented in a documentary style format in which I present information that is backed up with sources, references, evidence, and so forth. But in this series, I'll simply be sharing thoughts, opinions, beliefs, theories, or even rants about African civilization, culture, history, and technology. And my brain will be the primary source. With that said, no sources for this video will be posted on the site since these videos are primarily based on my personal opinions derived from my cumulative knowledge on the respective topics. Africa tends to be looked upon as a place that is, well, behind. Most of its countries are underdeveloped in comparison to the rest of the world with primarily agricultural based societies, crumbling or inefficient infrastructure, and most just have a generally lower standard of living. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, colonialism has caused massive instability throughout the continent. Civil wars, corruption, and the resulting poverty are typically cited as the primary reasons for this. However, some believe that Africa is in a stage of playing catch-up, so to speak, with the rest of the world. Before we get into that though, so it's been a fair amount of time since I've been using the coldest water thermos and I have to say, I don't think I could, sponsorship or not by the way, I don't think I could ever use a different thermos. This is, it, it's just crazy how effective this thing is. It keeps your water so, so cold. I, I literally put some cold water with ice cubes in it before bed, woke up the next morning, guess what? Still cold water and ice cubes. It's, it's like a miniature cooler, it's crazy. And I can honestly say, this thing has been helping me drink water more often because I've been pretty bad about it in the past. This thing has definitely helped me do it more regularly. The coldest water thermoses can keep your water icy cold for over 36 hours. This is accomplished through its advanced lid technology, which also includes this tiny little puncture hole, which lets in just enough air to build up pressure necessary to drink water through its built-in straw, thereby keeping your water much colder, much longer than other thermoses. It's so well insulated that it doesn't even sweat on the outside from condensing water, so everything around it stays dry. Also, if you take it in the water with you, it has a rubber grip and a handle so you can hang onto it easier, and it floats so you won't have to worry about it sinking to the bottom of the water. It fits in most cup holders, bike racks, and cars, and it also comes in multiple sizes. You can enter for a chance to win a free gallon thermos at the link down below, or receive a 10% discount on your entire order using my referral link, also down below. With the exception of the Nile Valley and the Mediterranean coast, much of Africa lacked the basic developments that most of Eurasia had long since assimilated into their culture centuries ago. Technology and innovations such as the wheel, the plow, and writing systems were absent in the majority of Sub-Saharan Africa. One major unifying religion like Christianity in Europe, Hinduism in South Asia, or Islam in the Near East didn't really exist in most of the continent aside from North Africa and pockets of West Africa and East Africa. Though all of these things were present in Africa, they were spotty and inconsistent, oftentimes being restricted to one small region of the continent while not present or completely unknown in another region. The Kingdom of Banyoro, for example, was perhaps the only region in the history of the world prior to the modern era to regularly perform successful C-sections, in which both the mother and the child survived. The Haya people of East Africa were the first to invent the open hearth furnace, a technology that allowed them to produce high quality steel using sophisticated preheating methods, a process unknown anywhere else in the world for nearly 2,000 years. The Igbo, among others of southern Nigeria, independently developed a writing system known as Nsidibi which has virtually no outside influence, and the neighboring Yoruba also have what many scholars believe to be an extinct writing system, which can be found carved into the Ikam monoliths. Both the Yoruba and the Igbo alike, as well as the neighboring Edo peoples, also developed sophisticated bronze casting techniques with the former accomplishing a level of realism on par with that of the works of the ancient Greeks and Romans. These are but a handful of achievements of sub-Saharan African people, but the problem, as stated before, is that they remain relatively restricted to certain regions geographically. By contrast, Eurasia as a whole shared many fundamental achievements at around the same time as one another over the majority of the landmass, including bronze, iron, agriculture, the wheel, paper, writing systems, and gunpowder. All of these innovations and technologies constantly spread through warfare and trade, largely through a series of massive, powerful multi-ethnic empires, and extensive and complex trade networks that extended east to west from China to Europe and everything in between. These people were separated by vast geographical distances, yet ideas continued to flow seamlessly, 
due to a relatively uninterrupted stretch of landmass with very similar climate and biodiversity. This uninterrupted region is also the reason for the occasional invasions by horse riding nomads including the Huns and the Mongols, and subsequently the spread of gunpowder and the Black Death, as well as many other good, bad, and revolutionary things. By contrast, Africa, with the exception of the Nile Valley, required the transversal of the largest hot desert on the planet, the Sahara, and the coral reef infested in the Ocean by sea, or the stormy aggressive currents of the Atlantic Ocean. As a result, most ideas, technology, or goods from Eurasia had to arrive in sub-Saharan Africa at a very slow and diluted pace. Despite the aforementioned barriers, over time, they actually became highways. The East African city-states and kingdoms, or more specifically those of the Horn of Africa, as well as the Swahili states, sailed to and from distant lands, including Arabia, India, and China. And they did this in sailing vessels that were built indigenously. Among those were the Somali Bedin and the Swahili Mtepe, this trade network allowed them to acquire immense power, wealth, ideas, and resources that those further inland had no way of enjoying. The Sahara Desert Barrier also became a highway, which led to some of Africa's largest and wealthiest civilizations. Crossing the Sahara Desert was an incredibly difficult task. It required sharp knowledge of astronomy for navigation and the locations of oases to fight against dehydration in the brutally hot and dry conditions of the desert, which spanned a region larger than the entire United States. The Atlantic Ocean, despite being a much more distant journey, could be completed around the same amount of time as crossing the Sahara by camel. With all these facts combined, it's no wonder that Europeans weren't even able to cross the Sahara and reach Timbuktu until the 19th century, and this goes to show how and why ideas spread to Africa at a relatively slow pace. Another reason why technology and innovations didn't grow as prominently or spread as rapidly as it did in Eurasia is because Africa is the birthplace of mankind. With that being said, the African continent is cookie cut and catered to the Homo sapiens species, providing all of the food, water, and resources, and even climate that we need to survive. The human race develops and innovates when faced with challenges. When our early ancestors first began to leave the African continent, we were faced with deserts, freezing weather, and animals larger than anything that existed in Africa. These challenges prompted innovation in shelter and clothing for warmth, and weaponry for taking down large animals. There was even competition with other hominid species like the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. The world's oldest known civilization rose along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in an otherwise uninhabitable region. These fertile river valleys would have been the only hospitable stopping point for many people from many regions and thus several ideas, innovations, and technology would have funneled into that one spot, a pattern that can even be seen in Africa later on in the Nile Valley. The innovations and technology that allowed these civilizations to function was absolutely crucial in maintaining a civilization that was limited to the proximity of a river. There are a few exceptions to this behind rule. For example, the Maghreb, which was an integral part in both the founding and maintaining of ancient civilizations of Carthage, Manoa, Greece, and Rome, all of which were seafaring civilizations to control land along the coasts of Africa, Europe, and Asia. The people of the Horn of Africa, or what is now Ethiopia and Somalia, also had direct contact with Mediterranean civilizations, since they could bypass the Sahara by traveling along the Nile Valley. This region gave rise to the ancient civilizations that existed contemporaneously with the classical world and traded extensively with Eurasia for millennia. They were well integrated into the trade networks, politics, wars, and culture of the region, and as a result, technology like the wheel, the plow, the writing system spread to these regions in a manner similar to the way that it did in the rest of Eurasia. As one ventures farther away from this region, this heavy Eurasian influence gradually diminishes until it's completely non-existent. West African civilizations like Mali and Songhai are a great example. They were African kingdoms in every right, but had heavy influence from interacting with West Asia in the form of their religion and writing system, as well as some of their laws and cultural norms. However, since they weren't directly tied economically or geographically, their need to adopt and innovate to compete with neighboring kingdoms was significantly reduced and technology such as the wheel and gunpowder only began to take hold when European merchants began to arrive in the region of the 15th century. Another example, the Kingdom of Zimbabwe only had nominal influence from the outside world by way of trade with the Swahili coast. They still practiced their own religion, architectural traditions, and cultural norms. The only direct evidence of outside influence was found in the form of goods that were acquired through trade with the Swahili states including Chinese porcelain. Congo provides another excellent example of an African empire that was isolated from virtually everyone. 
While there were other Central African kingdoms that bordered Congo, no direct contact with West African or even South African states is known to have existed, as the former would have been separated by vast expanses of sparsely populated jungle and the latter by the Kalahari Desert. Despite all of these factors, the peoples of Africa still managed to meet and even exceed the developments of other civilizations, but they failed to do so on a large or universal scale. There were no massive empires like Rome, China, or the Arab Caliphates to adopt or adapt and disseminate a variety of technology or innovations to various peoples. Europe today, for example, is what it is because of centuries of Roman influence. The Romans controlled, assimilated, and enforced a very Roman way of life on the majority of the continent, all the while adopting and adapting many ideas or innovations that they had picked up from conquered peoples. East Asian civilization takes most of its influence from thousands of years of Chinese civilization. The Middle East owes its accomplishments to millennia of ancient civilizations and innovations back from the ancient Sumerians to Persians, the Arabs, and even competition with Greeks, Romans, and medieval European kingdoms. Africa simply didn't have as big of a pool of peoples or ideas to tap into, therefore individual accomplishments remained relatively restricted to small dispersed regions of the continent. As always, this series consists of just my opinions or theories, and you are welcome to share yours, whether you agree or disagree, down in the comment section below. For sources, check out my website, linked below. If you'd like to support future projects, you can do so there as well, or by clicking the join button below, or by becoming a patron. I hope you all enjoyed the video, thanks for watching as usual, and always remember, we don't come from nothing.